10 seconds. All right, good afternoon, everybody, on this beautiful day. Um, so welcome to today's lecture by our 2024 Latin American Perspectives Distinguished Lecturer, Professor Susan Eckstein. For those, joining us, for those of you joining us on the live stream, uh, please submit any questions or comments via the YouTube chat section. Kindly note, closed captioning for the live stream video will be provided in the coming weeks. So just a brief word about the Latin American Perspectives Lecturer. Um, thanks to the generous sponsorship from donors of the Latin American Perspectives Journal, Stanford's CLAS invites both junior and senior Latin American scholars to campus for a short term, short term to lecture, teach, and do research at Stanford. So we're really uh, delighted and privileged to have Professor Susan Eckstein here uh, as the 2024 uh, such lecturer. Uh, Professor Eckstein is at the Party School of Global Studies and in the Sociology Department at Boston University. She's written numerous books and articles on Mex the Mexican urban poor, political economic developments in Cuba, Cuban immigrants, immigration policy, impacts of Latin American revolutions, and edited books on Latin American social movements and social rights, and on immigrant impacts in their homelands. And she's the author of the book, Cuban Privilege, The Making of Immigrant Inequality in America, the subject of her lecture today. She has so many other books and honors and prizes. Um, I think I'm going to take up too much time to read, so I'm just going to uh, give this personal note that um, uh, it was Alberto Diaz Cayeros who uh, invited her to come out because of her work on Latin American uh, social movements. That's initially what uh, he, he wanted, um, he was uh, interested in. Uh, but I actually had been planning to invite her to speak on this book, and I signed it in the fall quarter, as many of you remember, uh, master's students, um, in part because of the reception she got for it in Miami. Namely, a right-wing Cuban-American politician decided to use it as a punching bag because he disliked the title of it, Cuban Privilege. Of course, he admitted that he didn't read the book. That's the starry, sorry state of our politics today toward Cuba and all too many other foreign policy issues, as we, of course, know today on campus. So anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Steve Nexty, welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me, for the introduction, and the work that you people have done to make this trip possible for me. Um, am I speaking loud enough? I don't know anything about it. Is this loud enough? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I will give my talk and uh, then happily discuss anything you want. And I think maybe for those of you growing up on the West Coast, uh, it may be startling to hear about my lectures, actually, because it's really not the story of many of the Central American and Mexican immigrants, etc., that that come uh, on the West Coast. So anyway, so just starting with my cover which um, to me was very interesting to most people. It's hard to figure out what's going on. But this was in a picture in 1994 in downtown Havana. It, it, these are Cubans who are trying to go to the United States on a raft. And everybody's watching them. This is not authorized. These are people coming, trying to leave Cuba and come to the United States without permission from Cuba or from the United States to make the journey. So to me, it was amazing that this could be so much out in the open and the receptivity of the Cuban people to, to the fact that some people are trying to get out of, out of the country. And 1994, I will show you a, a graph, was one of the key years of mass migration from Cuba. So on with the show. Um, so, I don't know how much you know about U.S. immigration policy, this, this is a very quick summary. Uh, U.S. Po immigration policy changed, changed dramatically in 1965, because until then, in, in most of the 20th century, um, we had national quotas to the immigration. So, it, it, this was a, passed in the 1920s, the year that they used to allot immigration quotas was 1890 census. 
Why in the 1920s would they use the 1890 census to allot national quotas? In 1890, most immigrants to America were from Northern Europe, namely white. So they couldn't officially say we're going to admit you, admit you because you're, you're white and not admit you because you weren't white, but this was a way to, to do it, um, quote, legally. Um, and the U.S. got a lot of criticism for the po uh, that po po policy, including in the context of the Cold War, that America was racist to have this policy. So finally, the, you know, there's a buildup of pressure to have a new immigration reform. It finally gets passed in 1965, a major speech by President Johnson when he introduces it. You know, I went through the Johnson Library, there's all this discussion where and when, and they decided to, with the backdrop of the Statue of Liberty, you know, this was this momentous occasion. And um, so, the two things about it. One is, it ended the national quotas, okay? And it introduced this new system that's known as the preference system, that's enforced today. And it means that there's, there's like seven categories, um, mainly family relations, so immediate relatives, more distant relatives, and then uh, some of the preferences were for people with skills or money. You could actually buy your way into the United States, literally, if you promised like, to, to invest a million dollars. And then there was a final category, the so-called seventh category, that was for refugees. It was a very small allotment, and that disappears. So there have been, the immigration laws have you know, been tweaked over the years, but the basic fundamentals are, are from 1965. And in 1980, a, the U.S. passed a Refugee Act, and that got rid of the, they removed the refugee part of the in, immigration part. So, um, just a little alert. Johnson gives this very crafted speech in which he says, hey, from now on, we will be admitting people for who they are, not where they're from, etc." He ends the speech, maybe he had a glass of water, and then he says, any human who wants to come may come. Um, and um, it's not quite any human, but that is what he said uh, at the signing, uh, where he signed the, uh, the, uh, the bill uh, in front of the Statue of Liberty. So, um, I've already alluded to the fact that Johnson was making an exception from day one to allow Cubans in. But in addition to that, I just want to give you a few little vignettes uh, before I really begin uh, in my lecture. In 1991, under uh, George H.W. Bush, it's H.W., isn't it? I think I have it. Oh, it was a I'm sorry. It's H.W. So anyway, the first, George Bush won, okay? Uh, you have, in 1991, some Haitians are trying to get into the United States without authorization. They're in the Florida states. And they see some people in the, in, in the water whose boat has capsized, and they very kindly offer them to get on their boat and come with them to the United States. So they get to U.S. shores. The U.S. admits the Cubans and refuses to admit the Haitians, makes them repatriate. Similarly, a similar incident a couple of years later, we're now under George, uh, we're now under Bill Clinton, and a similar situation arrives. The Haitians are turned away, the Cubans are let in. You know, all they're all equally unauthorized when they reach the US shores. So, what's going on? Basically, for 60 years, more than 60 years by now, Cubans have been privileged over other immigrants. And I will Hope you understand that, the ways that they have been privileged and why. Um, stay tuned. So, um, okay, so here's the outline of where I'm going in my, my talk. I'm first going to give, give you a little bit of a perspective, put Cuba in pers comparative perspective. Uh, then I'm going to give you a sampling of the unique entitlements that Cubans have gotten, and only Cubans. And under Republican administrations, Democratic administrations, by presidents, and by Congress. Congress officially is in charge of immigration. So what, what presidents have, have certain discretionary power, but only like to let uh, immigrants in temporarily. They cannot bless them with um, 
an immigration visa and um, rights to citizenship. Okay, only Congress can regulate that. Um, so then I will discuss you know, these entitlements, then I will discuss why the privileging, and then I will discuss efforts to retract the, the entitlements and defiance by Cubans of the efforts to, to lim limit their ability to come. So and I'll bring it right up to date with the Biden, Biden administration and his policies in the last year. So let me begin by just giving a little comparative uh, sense about the Cubans. They are one of the top three Latin American immigrant groups and one of the top global immigrant groups that the US admits. And this is despite the small size of, of Cuba, 11, roughly 11 million people now. There are cities in this world that are bigger than the population of Cuba, okay? But despite the small size, they've been getting all these special uh, immigration rights. Uh, there are now roughly 1.3 billion uh, Cubans in the United States who were born on the island and about a million who were born in the United States. So, um, and Florida is the main <coughs> concentration of Cubans, which is one reason I think you probably don't hear that much about them here. Uh, but they, they've been the, the, uh, the predominant group, in the predominant demographic group, the predominant political group, uh, and in many respects, economic group um, in Miami in particular. So this last point is really, really important. Most Cubans have come to the US without immigration visas, and yet they've been able to become lawful permanent residents, LPRs, and become citizens. This is highly unusual, and at the same time, there are about 11 million unauthorized immigrants in the United States. So you can see here how differently the experience of Cubans has been in the United States. So here is just a little a graph of unauthorized arrivals uh, since 1980. 1980 was a significant year. There was a so-called Mariel Boatlet. Mariel is a, a, a port in Cuba, and in 1980 there was this mass migration, unauthorized migration from Cubans, where actually Cuban Americans were sending boats to Cuba to pick up their relatives without permission, but they were able to do it. And Carter, who was president at the time, tried to stop it and did not succeed, and actually wound up not only allowing them to stay, but giving them new entitlements. So then, in 1994, there's what's called the Balsero crisis, um, or Rafter crisis, and this was now under Clinton. And what was happening, this is after the Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, Cuba, in, um, after the revolution, as the United States tried to strangulate the revolution uh, never succeeded in undermining, though it's tried every possible trick there is to do so, but they managed to suffocate the, the, the island economy. Um, but so the Cuba, this Soviet Union stepped in when the U.S. pulled out. So it was, was one of the, probably the most disastrous, among the more disastrous foreign policies of the United States, because um, when the U.S. Uh, trained and supported an invasion of Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, it helped consolidate the revolution rather than undermine the revolution. And partly what happened was the opponents left, so it became easier for the Castro government to consolidate the revolution because the, uh, the opposition was out, although there they are in Miami trying in every possible way to try to undermine the regime. So anyway, just to fast forward, at, from after 19, in 1994, Clinton, as I will discuss in a minute, uh, makes an immigration agreement with, with the Cuban government to try to stop this mass migration from Cuba. Clinton, Clinton's already thinking of his re-election in 1996. He does not want, an, quote, another Mariel, because it devastated. It was not the only reason why Carter didn't win, but it certainly was one of the factors that hurt uh, Carter in the election, because he was, you know, attacked for not controlling our borders. Okay, the thing that you pick up again now with the upcoming election. Um, so anyway, um, this agreement with, with the Cuban government actually regularized immigration, and the U.S. agreed to, to accept a minimum of 20,000 Cubans a year. And the effect of that was for unauthorized immigration to, to really 
be reined in um, and stop being a problem. So then, just to recent years, as you can see here, 19, fiscal year 1922, look at that, it is more than those that came in those two years come on. Massive, and it just keeps going. The, you know, it's not, it's very hard to document, but they're staying there about half a million Cubans who've been coming in the last couple of years from Cuba. You don't hear that much about it, which is really interesting. These guys, the, whoops, sorry. During the um, boat lift and the rafter crisis, this was in the Straits of Florida, and it seems the media seems to like boats or something. I can't figure out why, but it got huge. This is like front page New York Times for month after month or something like that. And you hear very little about what's going on. And But this, this migration is over land. Uh, and one of the reasons it's over land is that Cart Clinton's agreement, Clinton's policies, not just the agreement with Cuba, was to stop Cubans coming from boats, by boats. And until then, until 1994, if the U.S. Coast Guard found Cubans in this, not just on, on, on land, but if they found them in, in, the, in the Florida Straits, rather than turning them back like those Haitians were turned back, they brought them to the United States. So Clinton tried to stop that. Again, politically, he wanted the Straits to be cleared of the Cubans. And so this is the, was the spirit behind um, what we now call the West, wet, wet, wet dry foot policy that some of you may, may have heard about. The dry foot policy was always there, which gets lost in translation. The wet foot policy is really what changed, changed under Clinton because he stopped it. That after that time, if, if the Coast Guard picked up Cubans, they were sent back. So it's really only the wet foot part. That, that, that's one of the few times that entitlements have been retracted from Cubans. So, now I'd like to go over some of the unique entitlements that Cubans have gotten over the years. And I, I want to emphasize some. There are others. I just, time is limited. But I am hitting on some of the major entitlements that Cubans have gotten. And um, there is no, because some are older, some are newer, there's not a, a, a chronological order to it. Actually, I tried doing it and just thought it was too hard to do. Um, but I put the years that they were in effect. So there was a, quote, airlift, in which one third of a million Cubans came to the United States at U.S. taxpayers' expense under Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Okay, um, a, a huge portion of them actually came under President Johnson on his so-called freedom flights. Uh, and this is part of any Cuban can come, right? And so then these planes were flown, from, uh, flown to Cuba to bring them to the United States. So that's one, but now sort of going back to the early years, it's, it's all after the Cuban Revolution, okay? Before 1959, January 1, 1959, when uh, Fidel Castro comes to, be, comes to power. Before that, A, there were not that many Cubans who were coming, and B, they were not getting particular special treatment. Okay, so after January 1st, 1959, it all starts. So after that, um, Cubans are let in as tourists, uh, even when they're known not to be tourists. It was a way to get Cubans quickly out of Cuba after the revolution. Much easier to get a tourist visa, as some of you may know, than to get an immigration visa. Okay, so they would be brought to the United States on tourist visas, and then the U.S. would change their status so that they could stay. Um, and again, this is at presidential discretion because um, they, tourist visas they could do, they could not get immigration visas. That has to be regulated by Congress. So then. Um, the uh, Cubans are guaranteed, as I've already alluded to, to a minimum, a minimum of 20,000 immigration slots. And that's the result of the bilateral agreement that Clinton reached with the Cuban government in 1994, with some revision in 1995, because he is desperate to get the Cubans out of the Straits of Florida because he's running for re-election already. He doesn't tell you, but the day after you, the president gets elected, the first time, they're all running, they're ready, they're running for re-election already. They're always thinking what I need to do to get re-elected. Sometimes successfully, other times not. 
at any rate, um, there, the Cubans insisted on the minimum of 20,000 because before that, there had been a maximum of 20,000, which is the typical rule for any country. There are exceptions, but basically a maximum of 20,000 at the time. But what like the Reagan administration did, because after the failed um, invasion of Cuba, etc., Reagan decides, okay, these, these policies of favoring the Cuban immigrants aren't working. I'm going to prevent them from around coming, this kind of suffocation, thinking that will lead the Cubans to rise up and overthrow the government. Um, so he was he actually admitted very few Cubans to the United States. And so it's against that backdrop that this immigration reform law or agreement is passed um, at, 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 with a minimum of 20,000 able to come here. And it's the only country that has a, a minimum entitlement. So um, the other thing is that uh, Cubans have been admitted as refugees when they do not meet the official refugee uh, uh, the rules, regulations for being a refugee. So uh, what, what the U.S. has done is um, what Eisenhower did and, and then Kennedy, et cetera, reinforced was if you came after 1959, which is when Castro came to power, you're a refugee, and therefore you get refugee benefits. And the U.S. offered Cubans the most generous refugee benefits it's offered any, uh, any quote, refugees. And that included um, job training, job placement, um, uh, what are some of the other, education, free college education. The, the, the entitlements were really huge. It was the, the most expensive refugee program we ever had. And it continued as such until 1959. So this is to say there was an end to one set of entitlements, but there have been other ways in which Cubans as I'll discuss, have been able to qualify for refugee benefits when they do not meet the official de definition of refugees. So um, another one of the amazing ones is Cubans who left uh, Cuba via Spain, because at that time they couldn't get into the United States, were then admitted to the United States. They were safely resettled in Spain, and they could come into the United States as refugees. Social construction of the category of refugees is one that is specific to the Cubans and not generalized to other aspiring immigrant groups. So then presidents have invented literally immigration categories to enable Cubans to come in and only Cubans to come in. So here are three uh, key uh, socially constructed categories for admitting Cubans and for actually providing them with special um, readjustment entitlements. So Carter um, in invented this category called entrance status pending. And it was very interesting because Carter actually was trying to keep the Cubans from coming. They're, you know, They were the Magyals. They were in the Florida Straits. He's, this is um, starting about April of 1980 and the Magyals. <coughs> Uh, what's called here the Magyal uplift ended in uh, September of 1980. So what's going on? Again, Carter's running for re-election that year. He does not want these people coming without authorization. He's being accused of not controlling our borders, etc. He can't stop them. They just keep coming. They've got the support of their families in the United States who are sending the boats over to get them, etc. So. Um, Okay, they're here. He doesn't want them just, you know, unauthorized around. He invents this category called entrance status pending, which allows the Magyals to now be in the country, be safe from deportation, and have work rights. Okay, and um, and so that was really the first one a kind of category that I could say a president had introduced. And then you find Clinton did something very similar with what he calls the Guantanamo entrance. I'm sure he is modeling himself after the Carter administration because he was also modeling himself to not do what hurt, hurt Carter. In other words, keep the Cubans out of the Florida Straits. So anyway, what, what Clinton did, because they also just keep coming, until he made the agreement with the Cuban government to legalize and normalize a, a, a path of entry to the United States, 
he had them diverted to Guantanamo. So Guantanamo has been important in U.S. immigration history before 9-11. And so uh, these Cubans who were taking to the Florida Straits thinking, we're safe, right? We'll be picked up at sea, we'll be brought to the United States, suddenly find themselves diverted to, to, uh, Maya, to Maria, I'm sorry, to Guantanamo. And they're not happy. And they start rebelling. And so, you know, the camps, uh, they're, they're basically prisons and there are uh, these riots, etc. And so this is no, no solution for, for Clinton. So he then decides to get this, to authorize a way for these uh, uh, Cubans to come into the United States, and he calls it the Guantanamo entrance, who are given the same entitlements, that they're not going to be deported, they have work rights, etc. And then Biden, I mean, just to show these things are still going on, I'm not just talking about the past, in January of 2023, just a little over a year ago, uh, Biden introduced a what he called uh, calls a humanitarian parole program. Now, this program is not only for Cubans. The other things I've described have only been for Cubans. This is for Venezuelans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, as well as for Cubans. Thirty thousand a month sounds huge. Well, it sounds huge, except if you remember, I showed you 220,000 Cubans were trying to get into the country in one year, in 2022. So, um, and the 30,000 are for the four countries, okay? So it's not just all for Cubans. So anyway, so Biden introduced this program um, that has allowed these Cubans to come in. So it's for the four countries, but of the four, the Haitians, as well as the Cubans, qualify for refugee benefits or refugee equivalent benefits. The others do not. And no official explanation why these four groups are being treated differently or why even those four are being privileged over other immigrants trying to get into the United States. But then, of those four groups, only Cubans have a path to citizenship. And that is, for reasons I'm going to elaborate in a minute, they have a special law that allows any Cuban who's been admitted to, into the country for one year, after one year, they can qualify for lawful permanent residency and citizenship. So of these four groups that Biden has blessed with the right to um, immigration, uh, te temporary immigration visas, parole, parole in immigration is a temporary status. It's not has no meaning connected to how the word is used in criminology. So it's a temporary status, and that's all a president can do. He can't give them immigration visas directly. So he has this parole, it's called humanitarian parole program. Okay, so um, that's the and then the other one is um, there are certain uh, entitlements that, again, only Cubans get. So Cubans can come to the United States anywhere. They don't have to come in through a port of entry and unique to the Cubans. And then you have the Cuban Family Reunification Program. And this was introduced under Bush II. And what it, it allows, essentially, for Cubans wanting to come to this, the country to essentially <coughs> jump the queue. And there's a big queue of people trying to get in legally with visas into the country. Under this program, they could bypass it, come into the United States, and then wait their turn uh, in the immigration queue from the United States. But in the meantime, you know, they can work, they, they're free of fear of deportation, etc. The final uh, point that one I want to point to is something called the Cuban Medical Professional Parole Program. And this was started under um, President Bush too, and it's really mean-spirited. It allows Cubans who are serving on um, official, um, uh, what do you call it? official uh, humanitarian programs overseas, like doing medical aid abroad or uh, you know uh, technical assistance or whatever. These are, it's been one of the successes of the Cuban Revolution because they have been very good in developing human capital. And so when other sources of, in, of income dried up, the Cuban government was really promoting internationalism, called internationalism, international aid, as 
a money maker. So doing good, but also making money, and there'd be state contracts to provide the medical aid or whatever. So what the U.S. government under uh, Bush two was to try to get them to sabotage the program and, and say, look, you can come to the United States. So Cubans working on medical missions overseas go to a U.S. Uh, embassy and ask to be admitted um, uh, into the United States and be let in. So that ended uh, in Obama's last week in office. It was really nothing other than a, a mean-spirited program. So that's only getting it to the United States. Now I want to discuss a few of the entitlements that Cubans, unique entitlements that Cubans have gotten once they're in the United States. So one is, they, the first two are extremely important. Parole, whoops, sorry. Okay. Uh, being, being granted parole status. Remember, that's a temporary status. Um, and, um, and just any Cuban who would touch U.S. soil would be paroled into the country until Obama's last week in office. So that is a biggie. Again, coming without authorization, touching U.S. land, you have a path to become a lawful permanent resident and, and, uh, and then a citizen. So that's one. The other is the Cuban Adjustment Act, and that's an act of Congress. It was passed under uh, under President Johnson in 1966. He, he was a master politician, and he really crafted to get support for, for, the, um, for this Adjustment Act. And partly, I think it was because he had said, any Cuban wants to come, and the idea, what are you going to do with all these Cubans that have really no legal basis, to long-term basis to be in the country. So I think the idea was, okay, they come into the country, and now they have a path to become legal. Um, what is significant is it had no e uh, expiration date. And most, if not all, other immigration laws have expiration dates. So this law is still in effect. And it turns out Congress is not great <coughs> anymore in passing laws, but it's even less good at revoking laws once they've been passed. So sometimes there's noise about revoking the Cuban Adjustment Act, but it never gets anywhere. Okay, so, and it means that any Cuban who's been in the United States for a year and a day it goes can become a lawful permanent resident and five years later a citizen. So this means, for example, that with Biden's recent parole, humanitarian parole program, the Cubans who get in on parole after a year qualify for the Cuban Adjustment Act. So they have a special path to citizenship through this humanitarian parole program of the Cubans. So then the refugee benefits, I've alluded to some already. I mean, the US has granted Cubans the, the most generous refugee program it's given anybody, any group, and, um, and they keep getting benefits. So in 1980, when, after Carter's trying to get rid of the Marielles, and then he concedes to let them in, um, he uh, supports a program to, that they get refugee equivalent of benefits, again, just for them. And that's actually what's happening now under Biden's parole program. The Haitians and the Cubans are getting refugee equivalent benefits, but the others are not. So I don't know what's going on at the bottom here, but. What's happening? I don't know what's happening. That's the slides. Something's happened on 12. Yeah. Yeah. The size, something's wrong with the size. Well, I, I can just go on and discuss this in terms of entitlements once they're here. In 1996, President Clinton passes a very famous welfare reform, ending welfare as we knew it. Uh, and what it was was very anti-immigrant. This 
was a period of a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment, like now. And uh, the law says that unauthorized immigrants never qualify for federal welfare. And lawful immigrants have to wait five years before they qualify for welfare, except if they're Cuban. So Cubans, on the basis of their nationality, are written into the welfare reform that they qualify for welfare immediately. However, they're authorized, unauthorized, or, or whatever. So, um, I have no idea what's happening, but we can move on. I know. This is very important. I didn't bring my cat, I'm sorry I didn't bring my computer with me, or we could just switch to it. Can we move on? This is. Uh, okay, so now I've, I've described a lot, but not all of the entitlements Cubans have gotten to get into the country and once they're in the country. So, why? have Cubans been so privileged over other immigrant groups? And um, my argument is it begins as a Cold War policy. It's, a, it's an instrument of US foreign policy, explicitly. I mean, going through the files, um, that president saw that the presidents in the first years after the revolution, they saw this as a way to undermine the revolution. Uh, drain Cuba of its human capital, which it did. Like half the doctors left, half the teachers left, etc. So, I mean, remarkably, Cuba trained a whole new cadre of doctors and teachers, et cetera. So Cuba, you know, they did drain the country of, of human capital. Um, and they also trained Cubans, or trying to train Cubans, for a post-Castro era, who would be trained in running a government and in a US-friendly government. So, um, and the other thing was just a demonstration of that. You know, if you have a lot of migration from Cuba, it would suggest that Cubans dislike the revolution and should, the, the regime should be replaced. So there were these political motives why these, the early presidents and the post-Castro, the, the period since Castro was, came to power, why they were supporting all these special entitlements for Cuba. Um, and uh, I, what I, 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 I put this last point in, it's not only the Cold War. That is definitely the background. But within that context, Cubans are starting to become politically important. First of all, the Cubans can vote, right? They have this path to citizenship. So they very quickly become a political force. And they become a political force particularly because most of them have settled in Florida. So, they, you know, in numbers, there's with strength. And Florida has become increasingly important in national politics in the United States in 1960. Um, so I don't know if you, you can't make it smaller, but you can just listen to me. So in 1960, Florida had 10 electoral college votes. Fast forward to 2024, 30. This is a huge increase. Which of course also means other states have less votes than um, than than uh, do the Cubans, and um, so um, so this is the issue. It, they're starting to become a political force. So I would not say you know in the in the during the Cold War it was the dominant factor, but it's an incipient factor that's building up. So we now get to the post-Cold War, so why should Cubans continue to be privileged? If I was right that it was a Cold War strategy, the US won the Cold War, they should start retracting the entitlements. But instead, the entitlements continue, and they increase, as I said, as late as this last year under President Biden. So my argument is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term path dependent. What happened is that the initial entitlements uh, turned the Cubans into, Cuban Americans into a, a major force economically, politically. And so that for those reasons, the Cuban Americans themselves were able to push for continued entitlements. And you can be sure that no president or presidential candidate ignores the Cuban vote, particularly since they are living in Florida, they're living in the largest swing state. 
And even though the, the swing state um, swung very, very, very red in the last election, even Biden won't, won't write off Florida. It's just too big, you know, a state for them to do it. So they're all, you know, candidates continue to, the presidential candidates and presidents in office continue to privilege the Cubans. So that's one thing. The other thing is Cubans now have 10 members of Congress, which is quite substantial. And uh, one of them in particular, um, Senator Menendez, uh, who has, heads the Foreign Relations Committee, is very powerful. Also, very allegedly very corrupt, <laughs> and it's not clear he's going to be able to run, run for re-election again. That remains to be seen. But he survived one other round, a previous round of accusations, and um, and he is very embedded with the Cuban community. He's from New Jersey, but very very embedded with the Cuban community in Miami, who give him money, support his PAC, help him get elected, etc. And so he's not going to go against the Miami community, right? So you're finding they have votes in, a, in an absolutely strategic state. They have very influential politicians. Um, and um, um, oh, the PAC. This is also very interesting. President Reagan helped the Cuban Americans form a political action committee modeled after APAC, which is the, um, the Jewish lobby, uh, pro-Israel lobby uh, that some of you may be familiar with, given current politics in the United States. But he, he had his people inform and train the C Cuban American politicians to form their own PAC. And they did, and for uh, a good, I'd say, a good 25 years, they were quite influential. They, what they did is they, they supported the candidates who um, the PAC did, so, who would advocate for the policies that they wanted. So, like for uh, the embargo, making it a law. Until 1996, it had not been law, it had been a presidential discussion. They lobbied for a law that put the uh, embargo in, into legislation, so now it's like one of these things. How do you re revoke legislation once it passed? The president can't just say, end to the embargo. They could have before 1996, they, but they can't now. Congress has to say that. And um, and so the PAC, you know, helped elect people in Congress who would support the legislation that they wanted. So it was very targeted. It wasn't just giving it to Cuban Americans, it was giving it to other legislators who would advocate for the policies that they wanted. And in fact, some of the major uh, proponents of the policies that the, the PAC wanted were not Cuban. Um, so anyway, so there's kind of a multi-thronged basis by which the, the Cuban Americans have become politically influential, even though they're about 1% of the population. It's just they're strategic, located in Florida, and so they have outsized influence. And I'm sure many of the immigrants in California wish that they had. Um, okay, onward. I'm sorry, it's not. So I'm just uh, opening a different version. Okay. So oh, okay. And we can, we can move beyond that. Okay, so now what I want to discuss are efforts to retract entitlements for Cubans. And um, the most significant for this seeming change in U.S. policy is under President Obama in his last full week of August. He ends Cubans' rights to par parole. So that B, that way in which any Cuban who touched U.S. land was safe and sound here, ends. And it does seem as this is the, a turning point in U.S. Cuban immigration policy. Except, as you can see, they keep coming, right? So, um, so he ended that, and then he ended this medical professional parole program, which really 
as I said, was mean-spirited and hard to justify. So this is Trump, uh, Obama's last full week in office, and then comes Trump. And what Trump does is he also further restricts rights for Cubans. He um, defies the bilateral agreement with Cuba that, to admit a minimum of 20000 a year. And in, for example, 2018, he only admits about 4,000 Cubans. This is part of his anti-immigration strategy in general, but it is affecting the Cubans. Uh, we can go into it more. It's a little more complicated, but it, it sets the, the, the stage of what happens. Um, and then he first limits and then suspends the Cuban um, family reunification program, which was rather unique, although afterwards a similar program had been introduced for Haitians. Um, and refugee admissions as a special category since the passage of the 1980 Refugee Act, where their allotments, presidential discretion with congressional approval uh, for allotments to certain regions of the world, and then how it's divvied up within that. And remarkably, almost no Cubans come in officially as refugees. Uh, which is really, you know, quite striking given, given the whole that, that background. Part of it is they had other ways to get in by then. They didn't have to come in as official refugees. Um, and they didn't meet the, most of them did not meet the official definition of a refugee, meaning somebody who's been suffering a persecution or has uh, real fears and provable fears that they would suffer persecution if they stayed. Um, and there, some of it, you know, there's a tiny number of Cubans who are coming in, under, but that's not explaining what the 220,000 Cubans who just came in, in, in a year ago. So, um, it, what you're seeing is there's this official uh, retraction of entitlements, and it seems like the game is over. Cubans no longer are privileged. Uh oh, there comes Biden, and suddenly, despite there's a turnaround, and uh, Biden resumes visa processing in Cuba to enable <coughs> Cubans to come with visas to the United States. He resumes the Cuban family reunification program, and then he introduces, as I mentioned, this two-year parole program for not only for Cubans, but for Venezuelans, Haitians, and Nicaraguans as well. And um, so that's another entitlement that reversing this trend of retraction of entitlements. And, you know, as I said, the Cubans alone can leverage the parole po program for lawful permanent residency and, status and citizenship because they have the Cuban Adjustment Act. It's an act. Presidents can't get rid of it. Only Congress can retract it, and they haven't. So they still have these entitlements, and so Cubans marvelously continue to be able to come here. Um, so now what I think is really interesting is, you know, we think the state is all powerful. Well, one thing I've showed you is the limits of U.S. power, that all these efforts of the United States, and there are many more that I didn't discuss, not only for immigration policy, the U.S. has tried to undermine the revolution, and there's the, re the revolution has survived. It is, it is a life support now, I would say, but it hasn't been overthrown. Um, and so here we have data of this, you know, picking up of immigrants, unauthorized immigrants to the United States, despite Obama ending the parole pro program. The U.S. can't control it. And I would argue these are ordinary Cubans with transnational ties that are able to defy the U.S. rules and make their way to the United States. It is not cheap. That because now we can't, through the Florida Straits, not that many have been able to get through because of the, of the policing that's gone on. So it's been this long trek, initially starting in Ecuador, 7,000 mile trek to get to the U.S. border. Now that most of them are coming like they fly to Nicaragua, Nicaragua charges like $3,000 for this short flight from Cuba. They're making a killing off of the Cubans who are trying to come and who are getting the support of their families in the United States to be able to be today. You cannot pay $3,000 on your salary in Cuba. Um, so uh, what, what you're finding is that the ordinary Cubans are just finding ways 
to get around restrictions. So, um, for example, you know, first Carter stop, Clinton stops the, the Florida Straits, right? So they now, after that, they go through land through this trek that I, I put out. They weren't doing that before. Before they were just going into the Florida Straits, a 90 mile trip to the United States. But when that got closed down, they found this other way with human smugglers. Okay, this is a highly expensive, well organized network that gets the Cubans to the United States. And it is not cheap. Um, and, and then um, Nicaragua, the government in Nicaragua gets into the scene, so it shortens the trip to the United States. But it's still expensive because the Nicaragua government wants to profit off of it, not just the human traffickers or human smugglers. So um, it's, I just really want you to see it's ordinary Cubans. It's the Cuban, they're not doing what the Cuban government wants or what the U.S. government wants. And they said the collective effect of ordinary humans is that they find ways to get around restrictions that get in the way. So now, what many of the Cubans are coming in or trying to get in as asylum seekers. No Cuban used to come in as asylum seekers. Some had come in as refugees, very few. But what I think the Cubans have learned from the Central American experience, right? Central Americans coming in as asylum seekers. So they've invented a new way to get into the United States. So you come as an asylum seeker. It's, I think, almost unheard of to get asylum in less than a year. And after a year, the Cuban Adjustment Act is there, and these Cubans who are claiming asylum are able immediately to adjust and become lawful permanent resident and then a citizen. So it's very, they're very creative. They found ways to get around regulations that get in their way. And so as a consequence, they've been able to keep coming here to, to the United States. So why the surge? OK, I, I just, I, I, how am I doing with time? Yes, yeah, we should start wrapping up. Oh, I'm wrapping up. So why the surge in asylum seekers? It, uh, there's a set of factors. One is economic. The conditions in, in Cuba uh, are disastrous, um, particularly since the, the pandemic. Tourism has collapsed, which was its main source of income, to, and visits by Cuban American family, partly because of tourism restrictions, but also because of restrictions by the Trump administration, making it hard for them to come, uh, putting cracking down on, on Cubans' right, Cuban Americans' rights to send remittances to their family in Cuba also hurting the people on the island and hurting the government, which wants the hard currency. So scarcities, you know, and that, the scarcities then are driving up the prices and life has really, really become difficult in Cuba. So that's one. And then social psychological, Cubans don't see any future. I mean, I'm sure there's some exceptions, but generally, ordinary Cubans do not see any future in Cuba. And they see it in Miami, because they all have family in Miami, or they know people who have family in Miami. So it's part of their repertoire of what to do, and particularly the younger generation who sees no future in Cuba. Um, and then there's a contagion effect. The people around you, in your neighborhood, in your jobs, etc. they're all talking about how can I get out, etc. It gives you the incentive to do the same and is contributing to this mass migration from Cuba. Politically, disillusion with the government. I would not say this is not defection and kind of the Cold War view of the world. These are just ordinary Cubans who aren't happy with the Cuban government because life is so difficult uh, for them. And then um, Nicaragua has made it easier by dropping the visa requirements, so it's much easier for the Cubans to get to Nicaragua and make, make their way with human smugglers to the United States. And then, as I said, the Cubans had invented this new category to get in asylum seekers. So they get to the border and they say, I'm, I'm seeking asylum. And then they're in the country. A year later, they become lawful permanent residents. So what do we conclude? One, Cubans have gotten unique entitlements for over 60 years. And by unique, unique I mean entitlements they are getting and other immigrants from Mexico, Central America, or whatever, are not getting. Um, and it, as I've said, there's sort of a past dependency. It starts as a foreign policy strategy, but then creates the conditions for the continuation of entitlements in the post-Cold War. 
And if they've helped Cuba do well, and that's something I really have not elaborated here for reasons of time. I wrote a book called The Immigrant Divide, uh, How Cuban Americans Have Changed the United U.S. and Their Homeland, where I do detail go into how Cubans have done economically, politically, etc. Um, and then um, the final point I want to make is that ordinary Cubans have, you know, really had an important impact on the, the entitlements that they have, indirectly on the entitlements that they have received. It's not just the government, not just the Cuban government, the U.S. government, but they are the net effect of, of their their actions have been to really infect U.S. policy. And that's the end. There isn't any more. So. All right, thank you all for, for joining us, both in person and via live stream. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Eckstein, for, for your talk. And um, so I think the live stream will end now, yep. Yeah. But we can continue, or it does not yeah, end. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, no, oh yeah, and so, um, yeah, next week, <laughs> very important, on May 10th, um, uh, this will actually, this lecture series will be part of a conference at San Jose State University uh, called Liter Natura, Environmental Humanities in the Americas Conference. So that sounds really exciting if you can get down to San Jose, the Caltrain takes you right down there, right? Or you drive, carpool, or what have you. All right, um, and so we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, I don't know if the live stream will end. I just want to. Okay. Yeah. All right.